It's bookkeeping, forecasting, and negotiating. Three of the very most important uh, management skills that a small business owner needs to know. Bookkeeping surprises a lot of people that I say that, but you'll understand why by the time this uh, next couple hours goes by. I'm Steve Carver talking to you from Dunn, North Carolina in my home office. My presentation number 1080 on October 12. Thank you for joining my journey. And it's a pleasure to be on your journey of entrepreneurship as well. I am not a lawyer and not a tax accountant, but I am a fellow that's been in business for a long time and still in business today. Not someone that read a book and wants to give a class on it because I do this stuff every day. Matter of fact, today I had a really good day. I had several good sales, collected a little money, uh, put in place my advertising campaign for the next 60 days. Uh, so I've been doing what I've been preaching, plus i uh, talked with a lot of uh, the folks that are in classes, answered some questions. So it's a, it's a real pleasure. But the best advice I can give you is before you make a serious move in your business for financial security, get a second opinion. Just to bounce it off of, and I'm not saying that you can't make opinions, but if you're doing things in areas you had never done before, it's always kind of wise to talk to someone, and they might be able to give you some advice that saves you some time and money and effort. And one of the very best places that you can get a good second opinion and advice is with the small business center at your nearest community college. And we're so blessed uh, tonight to be sponsored by the Samson. Uh, Community College Small Business Center, where Bart Rice is the director, and I uh, understand that uh, Latoya, that you are working on getting an appointment with him, and I'm sure that would be a wise thing to do. And Janae, if you can get an appointment with uh, with Brad, I, I'm sure you'll consider it a good move, because they got a lot of good ideas to offer, and, and hope that you can uh, benefit from that. But in Clinton, uh, Bart's the guy. His phone number is 910-900-4025. So let me encourage you to get an appointment with Bart, talk about your business, and he's got a lot of free uh, extra counseling that he can um, plug you in with there at the Small Business Center. Elizabeth Sanchez is his administrative assistant, and she's a good little business lady as well, and she owns her own photography business which we'll talk about it a little bit later. So give one of them a call and set up an appointment. The handouts that went to you, and hope you got them. If you didn't, let me know. Or, of course, the talking points for the night, number 1080. Several good handouts about negotiating and forecasting. Uh, the requirements to earn your certificates this year. And also the quiz with answers. The quiz with answers are in your handouts now, so it's important that we're not have an open book quiz. And I've already given you the answers. It's just up to you to read them, kind of become familiar with them, so you can transfer them over to the quiz without answers that I'll be mailing to you probably tomorrow. Uh, uh, next week, which is actually part seven, uh, it's going to be about basic taxes, record keeping, and secrets. Next week is required class. You have to uh, come to the last class to be eligible for the certificate or a graduation certificate. So make an effort to be with us to be at part seven. I'll be mailing you again, I'll be mailing you the quiz. When you fill in the answers to the quiz, make sure you put your name as you want it to be shown on your certificate and your mailing address as that we mail them out directly. And Sarita, glad to have you on board as you'll be helping us with these certificates when they are ready to finish up. To get an achievement certificate, all you have to do is attend five of the seven classes, including the last one, and get the quiz back to me. For a graduation certificate and the membership into the Academy of Entrepreneurs and Associates, you need to do the above, which was to five classes, return the quiz, send me a menu of five profit centers, mission, vision, promise statements, an introductory video, uh, uh, create a Facebook page, or uh, my business on Google account. 
and share some, some introduction type photos that could be used for your marketing. And then you got the option to get an extra mile certificate to do all the above that we just talked about, plus one extra thing or more, but one is sufficient to rewrite the 40 uh, drill skill rules and in your words after each one on tell how that rule will probably be applied in your business. Uh, do a Facebook business page where you post your video, uh, create an account on Google, and I'd really like for you to do a testimonial that uh, about thanking the uh, Small Business Center and the impact that the Academy series hopefully will be having on you and your business. Keep in mind, this is not take it or leave it. I want everyone to qualify for all the certificates that you can. So if for whatever reason in your situation now you can't complete those, let me know. Maybe we can substitute something in. Anyone that's wanting to do more, I want to help you do it and let us send a certificate out to you. My job is to motivate as always, and uh, uh, we are got uh, you guys back with us, so apparently you're motivating yourself. Let's talk about what's going on. Pam over in uh, Rose Hill has really gone forward with her business, uh, starting to kick in now. So it's going to be called the PNP Farms, where she'll be selling items that she grows uh, and or and or cooks or does whatever that uh, it takes to put it on market. She came forward with a menu listing the vegetables and meats and eggs and fresh and canned foods and all those things. She's going to be doing some jellies and jams. Looking forward to that. Valerie's uh, business has really improved this fall, she said. She's kicked her marketing back in gear, so we're happy for her. And there's Sarita, who's always kicking around, I think, I hope you're feeling better after your uh, uh, illnesses uh, earlier in the fall and getting in full swing now. And maybe the number one uh, student in all of our classes this fall is Latoya. It just does such a great job. I'm so proud of you, Latoya. She's with us tonight as well. Let's look at this. She came up over with some great images. Uh, got a good business name she's got going on. Send us some uh, uh, introduction and information about herself. Core values, did a great mission, vision, and promise statements where she put a whole new concept in the way she approached it, but I really like it. It is different. It will make a difference in your business. I'm just sure of it. And the things that you say indicate about your uh, uh, Christianity and uh, absolute commitment to doing business the right way. I'm so proud of you for putting that in writing, and I know that your customers will see that and go forward with what a great deal it is. Really like the business name, self-care, self-aware, and healing. It's got a nice touch to it. And uh, and when you end up your video and say, I got you, I like that as well. So let's look at that video. You guys turn your, uh, turn your uh, 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 speakers up and let's see if you can hear this nice video that Latoria's done. Let me tell you, she's got some good statements in here. You did a great job doing that. And when you're ready, Ashley, to start selling products or you want to go big uh, to bring in customers, you feel like you're all set, then we'll take this video and enhance it uh, with some uh, script and music maybe or, or put some photos, uh, still photos in here and turn this introduction video into, a, into an advertising uh, commercial. So, excuse the phone rings, it's still a business time in the rest of the country, so here we go. Hi everybody, my name is Toya Renee, and I'm from Bay Company, and I'm here to talk about self-care, self-care, and self-care, and I'm going to be talking about self-care, self-care, and I'm going to be talking about self-care, and I'm going to be talking about self-care, and I'm going to be talking about self whether it be skin care, body care, care, anything that you may need, I'm, I'm here, here for you. It's, it's time, time to take care, care of you or change. change. And, and I got, I got you. you. I'll see you soon. Bye. Fantastic. Hi, my name is Toya Renee, uh -oh. and I'm a home company. Very good, Latoya. Looking forward to seeing that a bunch on Facebook and on your website one day. Darcy uh, uh, is, is on the move up in Raleigh. She's getting ready to start her own floors when she can get everything lined up. So proud of her. She's working and staying in good touch with us. And look at there. There's Janae, who's got two, two businesses she's thinking about pushing forward with and actually 
I got uh, people lined up to do business. So today, when you're ready to get those details down in paper, we'll help you push it and, and uh, get more business. Jeff Smith has been with us a time or two. He's the new owner of the uh, campground called Gilligan's Island, where I'm a, a, a renter there. Norman and I enjoy time there as much as we can at White Lake. He's really uh, moving to improve his website and uh, bringing in new customers. And it's working. He, uh, several times, uh, during the past month, he had no vacancies whatsoever, so his efforts are, are paying a dividend. Tisha, uh, Tisha over in Magnolia continues to be a great student and hanging in there, as does Casey down in Wilmington. Casey's uh, selling her uh, homemade uh, remedies out of uh, natural products. Uh, she's a nurse, so she knows what she's doing and certainly wish her the very best. Annette gave us some good news last uh, yesterday in that she has been kind of wobbling all fall so far about what she's going to do, but she has decided that she's going to become a virtual bookkeeper, and she's naming her new business Blessed Bookkeeper. So congratulations, Annette. She'll be coming forward with the rest of the items, I'm sure, in uh, shortly. But uh, it takes you first commitment to get, get involved, so we're proud that she stuck her toe in the water and is uh, ready to move forward now. Cheryl's been with us a time or two, and she's getting her business up and running, doing more work. And uh, hopefully, uh, y'all uh, Lisbeth Town ladies have gotten together and compared notes. Maybe that's going to be a good thing that you can help each other out. Sabrina over in Raleigh is, uh, continues to uh, join our classes, and she's pushing her new business, Unchanged Edibilities, uh, forward. She is a, a minister now and uh, does a, has a great YouTube channel. That I shared y'all uh, links to. I hope you'll check her out. Elizabeth in Clinton with her photography work. Very professional, very good images on Facebook. I'm sure her business is going to go well, and she can teach us all about imaging. So when you get your business up and running and you want us to help you learn how to market it and promote it, uh, I'm ready to help you just uh, do it. And if you know someone that's thinking about starting a business or needs some help, Please send them on to us. We'll be glad to help them with a lot. But I want to see that introductory video from uh, from uh, uh, Janae and, and the other folks because that is really the first step when you make a commitment. Okay, I'm ready to get out of the closet and go public with my business and put my face out there with my business name. That is a great sign. So I don't keep motivating. Your job is to keep finding the endurance to stay in the game. And I know it's difficult, as we said. Setting priorities to, 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 to move your business forward is a tough thing to do when you've got so much else going on in your life. But let's remember, if, once you get your business started and you're marketing, then you can add things very easily. And I want you to have items that people want, and I want you to have items that people need. You want things that people need so they keep coming back to you all the time. Uh, for repeat business and sustainability, it's a good thing to have regular customers that are spending money with you every week or every month. It's going to be hard to make a lot of money, a lot of margin on things that people need because they shop hard and they're not going to pay for any more than they have to because they're having to buy this stuff all the time. But if you find some items that people will continue to buy from you on a very regular basis, and that'll be very, very important to you if you can get that continued business. Uh, I noticed uh, Janae with some uh, Facebook advertising uh, on some items that might qualify for that, especially if, they, if I knew more about it, they may already, but that's the kind of things that I'm talking about. You can add a lot of products, even though you're offering a service type business, that doesn't mean that you can't be offering uh, products for sale as well to uh, pick up your uh, your cash flow. But you want things that people want as well and that you can connect for upsells. Uh, the things that people want, they generate impulse items and you can make more money because they're not going to shop as hard for those. So try to have a mix of diversity in your products that you're offering and it will give you real staying power. So it's time to get off the, off the benches, out of the chairs, and let's stop being a spectator and actually get in the game and become a player. Being a player gives you the ability to make some money. Of course, you have to do more work, but that's what you're here for, right? 
just get off the benches and into the game, become a player. It's it's a World Series time, so it's time to think about getting in the game. So let's let's do that thing. Forty drill skills. We've gone through them all, or we'll finish them up tonight. We may be finishing up on the most serious, and a lot of these are in your quiz, so you might want to pay attention here. Also, you've got an opportunity to take these 40 drill skills that I hand out of mail to you every week almost and put one sentence under each one of them and say how, how that will affect your business or how you plan to use this drill skill uh, in your own words and just email that, email that back to me, and that can qualify you for the extra mile award as well. The importance of showing a new customer, a new contact, that you are excited about having a relationship with them is imperative to nail it down. When you see someone coming towards you or you know someone's coming in or you have a chance to meet someone new, if your attitude is, okay, well, it's good to see you. What's your name again? If you play it low key, like you're not impressed with them, I'll guarantee you they will remember that. But if you're excited, actually get up, go meet them, shake hands, go greet them really well. I'm so glad to see you. That greeting is important. It is like a foundation block when you're dealing with a customer or a potential friend or, 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 or anyone that can be important to you. They need to see that you're showing some enthusiasm about you're glad to see them to the point that you will get up and greet them uh, with respect. In the South, they used to call this, you know, hosp Southern hospitality. Uh, with ladies, it's called being, you know, gracious. But with entrepreneurs, I'm calling it being smart. Showing the energy to leap when you have a chance to acknowledge a, and welcome every single customer that you have a chance because it will make a, a really good impact on those and just go a long, long way. Several of well, uh, Sarita has been in face-to-face uh, -face classes where I, I've been teaching. And I, I really try to go the extra mile that when someone's coming into the classroom to a, to a seminar, I make the extra mile effort, if I possibly can, to get over to them, introduce myself, I want to hear them say their name, and I usually try to repeat it, so I, maybe there's a chance I'll remember it or something about them. And, and these are folks that have never seen me before, and I've never seen them, but I want to remember them. I like to see that smile on their face when you almost make them introduce you, because some folks don't know how to introduce themselves. It's pretty incredible that someone's thinking about becoming a business person that has no experience saying, hey, I'm so-and-so, and, -so and go on and, and talk a little bit. So be excited about being able to do that. You want to keep your radar turned on. You want to be aware of what are hot things, what are things that are new coming into the marketplace that you might be able to add into your business. The hot things are the things that money is going to be made at, or there's going to be a lot of volume, or there it's worth going to extra efforts to get them locked down. Now, you need to be smart, and you need to do forecasting and some surveying and not go wild out here. Remember I said, let's connect the dots that make sense with each other? That doesn't mean you out here after fads or, or things that's like a firecracker. You know, light it. It's going to blow up, and it's going to go away. But products and services that are in deep need now and will be in need for, a, for a, a good while forward, that's what you want to keep looking for. There are new wrinkles, the new things that can help your business be more sustainable, offer more and better services to your customer. It's kind of like, it's kind of like surfing out in the ocean. If you're on the front side of that wave, or hanging ten, as they say, if you're on the front side of that wave, you can kick it a long way and get a lot of benefit and enjoyment out of it. But if you're back on the back side of the wave, all you're going to do is just float and bob, and you're not going to go anywhere because the waves are going to carry you up and let you down. That's what you do when you've got a product or a service 
that is not exciting anymore, and you may or may not get any more business, but as long as it's bringing you a little bit, you're hanging with it, and I'm not saying that's wrong, but what is wrong is not looking for the new hot thing that you can tie yourself and your business to and enjoy years of good business from it. So be open, be flexible for diversity to find and get more items that are the hot things to do. I want to tell you that in business, you're, you're going to be making some decisions. They're going to be thrown at you, and that's part of doing business every day. And to make decisions and to have the products and services that people want, you'll be doing some forecasting and, 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 and uh, trying to figure out what should be there. Now, why should you do that? Why should I be concerned of that? Because an experienced business person who knows how to forecast, and it's just a part of what they do and, and know they need to do it, will be the one that stays in business because uh, accurate forecasting helps you dodge the bad curveballs that come your way, uh, help you avoid pitfalls, uh, help you avoid unpleasant surprises or unexpected expenses. And you never know when something's just going to blow your business away or make it have to quit. So that's why you need to do your risk management stuff. I was thinking a little bit earlier today about the uh, about the business people over in uh, in Israel. You know, last Wednesday everything was fine; the world was a great place to be. And then all of a sudden, you got a war started in your neighborhood. And don't you know that those people are just incredibly uh, concerned about uh, their safety and their family number one, but if they're business people concerned about their business and their employees because it's all a big question mark now. And we never know what our next day holds. As secure as we think we may be, you just never know. But I can tell you this, if you've got informed and structured forecasting in your DNA as a business person, and you've thought about the what ifs in advance, there's a good chance that you've got risk management uh, things in, in place that maybe will save you. But if you haven't done any of that, then you're down the drain with the rest of the people that are down the drain, you know, that are not by their own fault. Some great business people go out of business. Some great entrepreneurs go bankrupt. Some really good uh, uh, people, good folks, not evil folks, but good folks, have things happen to you and just knock you out of the game. That happens. It can happen to me, it can happen to you. But it is less likely to happen if you have done better forecasting and have a structured way of thinking, mindset is the word I'm looking for, to help you avoid these things. So keep that in mind. Next. You can be a very successful negotiator. That is someone that writes and closes good deals, makes good sales, provides good service, writes good contracts. You, you can do that. But I can tell you now a little secret that the approximately 10% of the people negotiating today will get 90% of the best deals. 10% will get about 90% of the best deals. And why is that? Because they understand that with extreme preparation, going the extra mile to practice, getting your information in place, being prepared is so important. Now, I'm sure that, Janae, through the years, you've probably, uh, as an educator and administrator, had to train young uh, teachers and folks in the classroom and you probably preach this same lesson that the better prepared you are, the better things are going to work out. Well, it's the same way when you're talking about negotiations. And most of us as entrepreneurs are having to negotiate to keep our businesses alive on a regular basis. So I don't talk a lot about extreme preparation tonight because it is the secret, one of the main secrets to help keep a new entrepreneur in business when so many of them can't figure out what happened. <clears throat> You've heard this statement before, and I'm happy to make it again. 
And you won't go wrong by putting this some way in some words into your mission, vision, and promise statements. Because it is so true. People don't really care about how much you know until they know how much you care. The relationship is more important than the deal. The trust is more important than the deal in the long run. Deals are done one day at a time, but continuous business, sustainable business is based on a continuation of trust and people doing having honor and, uh, and doing what they're supposed to do. Keeping a relationship with anyone is for you make, is for you to make sure you're not coming across as a know-it-all. That really turns a customer off. And they may be polite to you and shake their head. But while they're doing that, what's going on in their mind is, oh, man, he's just a know-it-all. He likes to talk and brag on himself. And here I stay online three nights a week and sometimes four nights a week. And I really don't want to come across that way. And sometimes you just have to guard against it and try not to because when you're teaching, it's easy to come across that way. But I learn things every day and share new things with you guys every day and learn things from you. But I do care. I do want you to be successful. And I want to be, a, be able to say I was a little part of that. Y'all are helping me be successful in my work. I, I feel like I'm, I'm uh, uh, doing a good job because you continue to show that you're interested in what you're doing and taking what we're talking to task and putting it to work in your business. <clears throat> As we move forward with your customers and your employees, I would ask, how can you expect a potential customer or a present employee to really care about your future, about your goals, about how things are with you, if you don't show them that you really care about their dreams, goals, and how things are with them. Sometimes business people come across as this is all about me. Just give me your money, take the product, and get, get on. That's that take it or leave it stuff that I talk about often. But if you get your mindset into showing some interest in your potential customer and talking to them and listening to them, showing them that you care, guess what will happen? That's the raving fan customer thing I talk about often. Because that customer will become a raving fan customer strictly because they can have a, a, a mutually beneficial and helpful relationship with you. But you've got to show that you care about them too. Take the extra few minutes to talk to folks. Listen to what they have to say. Now this is going on so big time this week, I just heard it on the, the news tonight from a politician that a lot of people just love. And I'm, I'm, I did this slide two or three years ago, but here's the, here's the message, and it's so more important in 2023 than it ever has been. We have to recognize that lying and cheating and laughing about it or telling it like it's uh, an okay, telling your story uh, like it's the truth, and it is not, over and over and over and convincing a a lot of people, uh, half a nation, that uh, that you're not lying, and 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 doing this through charisma is a dangerous thing. And I've seen through the years business folks that do that same type of stuff, and it's really serious. You want to be that person that has integrity and character. And I believe that from the interchanges that I've had with each and every one of you that are online with us right now, that you do. But I need to encourage you to help me get the message out there that charisma does not replace character. And charisma and boastfulness doesn't do anything to improve integrity. And that's what we want to have in the uh, academy of associates and entrepreneurs is lots of integrity and lots of character 
And we want lots of charisma as well. But we're not going to pretend that it's a substitute. Okay? Give that some thought and see how it might apply to what you're doing and, and, and how you can prove your character and your integrity. And it's all about those mission, vision, and promise statements and then living up to it as individuals. Through the years, I've noticed from time to time that I would lose an employee from time to time, and it would surprise me. So I thought we had a great relationship. But I, I was trying to do the things I've just mentioned. And then it dawned on me one day that, you know, people very seldom quit a job. People very seldom quit a job, but oftentimes they will quit their boss and move on. Again, Janae, in public education through the years as administrator, I bet you know exactly what I'm talking about here. Sometimes people love the place they work, got no problems with their pay, but they're getting out of there because they can't stand that boss. So this is something that is important that I've stressed to y'all is future employers. You can be the best person you can and do all the things that we've been talking about in the last few minutes, but if you're not keeping an eye on your managers or your supervisors, they may be running off the best employees that you ever had. So always know that and keep it in the back of your mind. Stay in touch with your employees. And when you have feelers out there and you sense something's going wrong, you catch it before it, before it happens. Sometimes the boss or the, uh, the supervisor is not trying to be mean or not trying to run people off. They just haven't been trained or they just had not been lectured on what's right and what's wrong. They've just been promoted into a job and expected to know how to do it without any training. Or sometimes you get some folks up that are just let attitude go to their head, and and they actually become mean and uh, and and, uh, and and tough on the people working for them. You know what it takes to be a leader? It takes a follower. You know what it takes to be a boss? Someone that you're pushing in a job. Being a boss doesn't mean you're being a leader. So as we move forward, we want to have more leadership about us and less boss. We want to have proven leadership qualities. And if you don't have those, then it's amazing. Now, Janae, I know that you've got proven leadership qualities because you have friends in your profession everywhere who speak so well of you. But if you hadn't had that experience and all and had self-trained, so to speak, Pretty tough to do, but keep that in mind. Keep your ears open. Make sure you can keep your employees because rehiring and retraining employees is one of the biggest expenses for an entrepreneur. And if you don't have to keep doing that, you don't have to do it. Let's get in the game now. All right, are you in the game? Are you putting your Facebook stuff up? You doing, you're doing your YouTube videos? Are you making testimonials? Have you sent me your promise statements? Got some product photos out there, some vehicle photos. Got some business cards already. I didn't see many business cards come in. I appreciate the ones that did send them, but that's, that's, that's an absolute must for you. That's like putting your pants on in the morning. You need to have some business cards to be ready to hang out. All right, we need to post things on our web pages, uh, do testimonials. I uh, get people to give you testimonials. I want you to send a testimonial to the uh, small business center to uh, 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 send it to me or send it to them, uh, talking about uh, appreciation for what the work that the small business centers do and maybe the impact that the academy series here has had for you. Get in the habit of sending out testimonials and they will come back. Uh, people will recognize those and they'll be more willing to uh, do testimonials for you as well. Do the quiz. Get it on back to me if you can next week. Uh, make sure you put your name on it and your address, and we'll go forward with it. Bookkeeping, forecasting, and negotiating. These handouts are important, especially with negotiating, because there's things there that I'm not going to talk about tonight, but are very important as it comes to it. So put those in your business journal. You get a chance. Read through them, okay? Let's get serious now with our lesson. Bookkeeping. 
you want to know each month, are you making money or are you losing money? What am I making money on and what am I losing money on? What is the trend? What is selling so much more this month than it did last month and why? Is someone stealing from me? Have I got inventory that's missing? Do I have too much inventory compared to what I'm selling? The bookkeeper is the person that can answer these questions for you. Since QuickBooks came out, I guess some 20 years ago now, it seems like time has flown so hurry, it may have been 30 years ago, the managers and owners of stores have become less interested in bookkeeping because now someone else is typing information in a computer and it spits out your, uh, your monthly tax statements you have to pay and come up with some money to pay your sales tax or your uh, withholding taxes. And the bookkeeper is handing you these two pieces of paper. And a lot of managers, a lot of business owners, strictly say, well, bookkeeping to me is all about getting those three pieces of paper I have to write a check for every month. And I really get tired of looking at that. I don't like those pa pa papers because they cost me so much money. And especially they cost you a lot of money if you hadn't pigeonholed that tax money and you're ready to pay it versus having to go borrow money to pay your taxes. And it is amazing how many folks do that. So the bookkeeper can indeed deliver to you some information that maybe you really didn't want to hear. But old Papo Steve here is doing this lesson tonight to encourage you to learn to uh, withdraw from the bookkeeping information, what you need to be a better uh, business owner and manager, sales manager, and employer. The bookkeeping is an accounting function, of course. And people naturally think, well, let's talk about the accountant. Well, the CPA, or the accountant, that's a different person. That's not the bookkeeper. The accountant is an altogether different person, so let's get them out of the picture here first. The accountant looks over the bookkeeper's work, kind of says it's right or it's wrong. The accountant's mainly interested in the monthly and yearly totals, not the daily stuff. They want to help you with your annual financial statements, federal tax returns, stockholder issues, so mainly the CPA or your accountant is looking at the big picture, the yearly or the annual picture, where the bookkeeper is looking at things happening every day. Every daily transaction it goes into the books. That's why they're bookkeepers. All your transactions go into the books so they can be monitored, calculated, appreciated, or become afraid of. Bookkeepers do your financial transaction, your credits and debits. They produce invoices for most companies. They have balanced the ledgers, these are big papers with line item budgets on them. And most of the time, do payroll services. However, during the last three or four years, more and more small companies are giving that payroll work to a, to a, a, a small contractor, or maybe even one of you guys, if you decide to be a, a payroll uh, assistant online because you can do payroll work quite easily once you get set up to do it. But the bookkeeper back to them we're going to focus on. Their job is basically every day to start with a clean piece of paper that has a zero on it and work through all the business transactions that go through that particular day, list them down on paper. That's all the invoices that you send out to customers or customers paid for things and all the checks that have been written that go out and pay for the things that you bought so you could resell it. So you'd have a, a piece of paper for your income and a piece of paper for your expenses. But each one of them is going to be about the same. And in theory, you see where, on the, see where my cursor is on the screen right there? Put a zero on your uh, printout right there after a transaction and then move over here to the other side right beside this one. Put a zero right there. The bookkeeper cycle is going to start here at one and go all the way around, all the way through these different functions, back to here, and end up with another zero. They don't take all the money that's come in and come out, 
add it up, take it apart, see where every, the little pieces went, put it back together into the big number, and come around here to the other side. And there, if it's on the income side, ever how much money you took in, they're going to deposit it in the bank, have a bank deposit statement right there, so that you can see the books balanced. Checking wise, they don't see how much money that you wrote out of your checking account. That it would be a would be a minus, and then show that deposit and see if it was enough to cover it. And between those two pieces of information, you're gonna know if you had positive or negative cash flow on that particular day. Isn't that simple? How do you figure it out? Well, I just told you. And it right smack in the bookkeeper's lap. So let's kind of think about that a little bit. The bookkeeper's toolbox dictionary is what we're going to call the chart of accounts. And remember that spreadsheet where you got all the pieces, all the numbers coming and going? Each one of those lines represent an individual account, and that line will have a number on it. And those lines that are related to income coming in, in most new companies, the income or the assets are usually listed as 100 items, like 101, 102, 103, and so forth. The items about things going out, expenses, liabilities, red ink, those items are usually listed as 200 items with startup companies. And then you can go on down the line with different number items, like 300 items being the equity items. That's things that the stockholders and the, the uh, boss is interested in or the accountant, particular items, but not, not your daily, usual daily expenses. They're usually 100 in black ink or 200 in red ink. And that's the way they set up their books. What does it mean when you say set up your books? That means you take all your expenses and you assign a line item account number in your chart of accounts to each type of expense that you want to monitor or each type of income that you want to monitor. Some companies will be real specific and break it down a whole lot, like I'm going to show you how that works in a little bit, and others will be easy peasy and not do all the big breakdowns, but just they want a, a good idea of where the money's coming from and, 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 and where it's going. So let's take a look at that. So you've set up a set of books, you've listed the items that you care about monitoring, and that's called your chart of accounts. So now it's time to stay, start looking at some invoices and decide what you're going to do with them. As you do that, we'll call that keeping your journals, and that's done either on paper, old-timey way, or on the computer screen if that's what you're doing. What you did on the paper is very much the same thing that you would see in the modern on the computer screen. So we're going to look at something here, looks like from a building supply company, and talk about some things. Usually when you do an item for a customer, whether you do a, a day's work or perform a service job or sell them a product, you will create an invoice. You will create an invoice for your company. And on that invoice, you want to make sure you've got a date and you've got a number, invoice number. Why is that? Because in business, you're always having to go back and look at old invoices and records to determine something for a customer or something for yourself. We always have to go back and, and do things. That will be part of your forecasting uh, uh, equipment that you have is being able to look back so you, can, you, you can't tell where you're going until you know where you've been, and you find out where you've been by looking at your old invoices. So this particular invoice or, or, or a journal we're looking at here looks like for the month of March for a certain company. And notice that they have, have got their invoice numbers over here and their dates. It starts out with March 1st, invoice number 1561. So here's a little secret that you can know. You can always want to have your date on the invoice, and you always want to have invoice numbers that are in numerical order. One of the ways you can do that is just to use today's date as the invoice number. That way, everything's kind of wrapped up in one number for you. Uh, these people didn't do it that way. They've dated and, in, and numbered their invoices. They named their customers. 
their reference number there is their chart of account number. They named their accounts AR5, AR4, on down the line there. Now, well, maybe that is the customer reference number, possibly. Uh, accounts receivable, hardware sales, plumbing sales, uh, wire sales, and how much tax it took you. And that's, that's what this fella or business owner wants to keep up with, so that's his chart of accounts. Every company will have a different type of uh, chart of accounts. Now, I'll tell you this, as I mentioned last night, if you're going to set up a virtual bookkeeping service for someone, and I know that a couple of you are thinking about doing that, then you might want to set up your chart of accounts in your business on your uh, QuickBooks the way that you want them set up. And then when you take on a new client, then you will use those same numbers as best you can. And if they have a different wrinkle or whatever, you can make it the, ne the one next to it. For example, you might start up, start up your accounts by saying, okay, I'm going to do a 100, and then I'm going to do a 110 will be my next one, and a 120 will be my next one after that, 130. And as you bring in new customers, they may have a little different wrinkle where they've got a 110 income item, but they want to keep that with something a little bit different. So they might want to call that the next item number 111 or 112. Your interest is to keep harmony and make it easier on you because as someone that's doing a lot of folks' books to try to keep those charts of account as near alike as you can so that you're not always having to search for what number is this and what number is that, that it will start becoming uh, quite natural to you. So, Janae has opened up a gift shop, and part of her gift shop is going to be, she's going to be selling uh, household items, decor items, and candles. She's decided she's going to sell a lot of candles, and I'll mention there are some candle makers right there in Bladen County that you might buy products from. So, using uh, uh, Janae here as an example, uh, you got you just sold a box of candles in your store, and you have assigned invoice number 12-12-16. Well, right off the bat, as an experienced entrepreneur, I can see that was probably sold on December 12th, 2016. See the invoice number? That's, that's okay. That's one way to do it. It's easy to recognize what it was. The box of candles sold for $8.50. 7% tax added 56 uh, cent in the, in the deal. So it was originally $8 plus tax. Well, the first item we're going to kind of deal with and get out of the way, if I'm the bookkeeper here, is the tax, because that is not our money. That's going to come out, and that's going to leave us with $8 revenue, right? Okay. But the boss here wants to know, the owner of this company wants to know every way that that $8 came and, came and went. So I've got different charts of account to break it down, so I'll be able to tell them. I'm just not going to say you had an $8 sale. I'm going to give him a lot more information because he wants to know what that costs me. It costs you $2. That box of candles today cost you $2. And you paid $0.55 cent tax, I mean $0.55 cent freight to get it in, and you have a commission that you're going to pay your sales clerk, 10%, $0.80, cent. Wait a minute. Why 80 cent? Why 10 uh, percent should have been 80? Should have been 85, 85 cent. No, you don't pay commission on taxes, and you usually don't pay commission on freight. Uh, the different situations may change, but you almost never would pay a commission on taxes. Also, Janae has a customer loyalty campaign that she's invested in and wants to see that return on investment. So part of that return on investment for customer loyalty is 5% or another 40 cent. She has set up a targeted advertising campaign where she was spending 6.5% uh, uh, for advertising. So here's 52 cent that has come back in as that return on investment for targeted advertising. So to, in her eyes now, the cost of that sale, what, what have I actually ended up with here as margin? The cost of that sale was four twenty-seven. I've ended up with three seventy-three. 
I had a 53% uh, net cost and a 45%, I mean, 47% net margin. Okay, that breaks it down. Now, remember when we, in week two how we did the models, broke the models down? This is exactly a model, a, 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 a profit center uh, model so that you could plug in uh, to do that. So all this is linked together. Now this model is going to tell us that for each box that Janae sells, she's going to end up with $3.73. Well, that is a great margin, right? 47% margin. Hey, I'll take that every day. But here's what the important factor. We can't keep a business open selling a $3.73 item. You just can't do it. But if you're selling a hundred three dollar and seventy three cent items, that's three hundred and seventy three dollars. That sounds a lot better. That's a better deposit. Remember the we need to make some big deposits. And if I know I have this as one of my main profit centers, and I've got a certain goal to reach in income, maybe I need to stock two hundred boxes and have 200 coming in every month during the main sales season. I don't have to think about that, right? And if I have 200 boxes coming in, where am I going to stack them? Where am I going to store them? Do I have the display room for it? And let me guarantee you that if you've got boxes of candles in your store and a fire comes by, those candles are going to melt. Insurance. How much insurance do I need for these candles? All these are items that put you in the mode once you know what your potential profit margin is, how many do you need to stock, how many do you sell, how many need to be sold every month or every week, how much uh, insurance do I need to add in to cover this candle in stock. That's called forecasting. That's called forecasting. We've got a great product. We make a lot of money on if we can sell a lot of And then next, remember, we put some money aside for advertising. So we learn right here that we're getting that return back on investment. It's okay to spend that money. It's making that, that advertising is paying for itself. And as you look at your different profit centers, that's how bookkeeping information can help you make hard decisions. It is great when you can see the value of something that you didn't ever see value in before. So it is a big, big deal. The bookkeeping information is just not getting three pieces of paper you have to write checks for. The bookkeeping information is take it, tear it apart, seeing how you can get that information to make you a more successful salesperson and a lot better manager. So now let's talk about the bookkeeping side of this. Each one of these represented a, a chart, a line item on the chart of accounts. So the bookkeeper would have taken that circle we talked about a minute ago, started up here with zero, and on that particular invoice would have broken it down. She would have gone right by all the different journal entries for the different line of accounts, and she would consider all those and then write them down and or punch them into the, into the QuickBooks, and that's called posting. And after she took all the little numbers apart, pulled them out of the big numbers, and they got to add back up and equal the big number, right? So as you're doing that, that's called the trial balance, is seeing, if every, seeing if everything balances. Now, in this process, you might have to go through some worksheets to find your different charts of account and break things down. So that's called the worksheet at the bottom. That's the work you do between the trial balances and the adjusting journal entries. What is adjusting journal entries? Well, in bookkeeping, you've got to end up with that zero at the end of the day and everything's got to balance or the bookkeeper can't close those books for that day's work. All the invoices, all the little numbers from each invoice, and then all the accumulated little numbers from all the invoices you did that day, and there might have been 200 of them. It's got a, got a balance. The big numbers have to equal the little numbers when they're all added back up. And that's hard to do. It seems like it ought to be easy, but it's, it's hard to do. Like an old Humpty Dumpty, <laughs> when he falls off the wall, it's hard to put him back together again. 
And during the trial balances issues and the posters here, he's falling off the wall. The invoices are being torn apart. So let's say that instead of collecting, uh, I'm working for today and, and I made a mistake. I should have collected 56 cent tax on that box of candles, but I didn't collect but 46 cent. Hmm. A dime short of balancing. The, uh, the cash drawer balanced, but the bookkeeping record didn't balance because we have to pay the state 56 cent, but we didn't collect but 46 cent. So on that particular invoice, the bookkeeper would have had to have made an adjusting journal entry and explain why we're paying more tax than we collected. And so uh, he or she would write in there, we adjusted this line item on this invoice because not enough tax was collected and we have to pay it. It's just, just it and make a record of it, a record right to the invoice number and the item that was adjusted. Once that adjustment has been made, everything balanced and then you have a financial statement and now it's time to close the books and you do that by seeing what arrangement needs to be made for the money that was taken in or taken out. In other words, a grand, a grand total for that trip, for that day or for that month, uh, what was the grand total and how was it moved off, off this paper? Because it has to move off. To end up with a zero up there, if it's a net loss or a net gain, it has to move off. So let's say that we took in $1,700 that, on that day or on that invoice. And we would say up there that at the end of the day, when we looked, uh, put all our invoices together, on that day we ended up with $1,700 extra dollars. And here's the deposit slip. I, I, I took the money, I put it into back into the bank. I stapled that deposit slip right to this uh, daily report. And my job's done. And when the boss comes by or the auditor comes by, they can see that we took an X amount of money and it went into the bank or we spent X amount of money out of the checkbook, and here's the total of that, and here's a deposit that we made to offset it. And then again, like I mentioned earlier, we can see exactly on that day or that month what our cash flow is. Good or bad, it's gonna stand out and let you know. But so many entrepreneur owners don't have a clue how to do this. Say, I just don't, I can't figure out how, why my cash flow is doing this or that. I thought we were doing real good. Sometimes the bookkeeper is the place you don't find the right answers for. Think about that. Give value to the bookkeeper. Now, we need to talk about here, it's not all bookkeeper, but it's, it's in the same office, same area. What do you need to do to protect yourself as a new business owner against fraud and stuff? A few things you want to do. The person that's writing the checks, sometimes the bookkeeper, and you're trying to make a living, you don't have time to sit here and, and write checks in a, in a wide open business. The person that's writing the checks maybe don't have the authority to sign them. That's one step you can make to prevent fraud or theft. In other words, they go ahead and write the checks out so you as the owner don't have to spend that time doing it, and they're going to record them in. But as you're signing those individual checks, you're looking and you're doing, you got the mindset to say, okay, this seems in order or to say, show me the invoice on this. I want to see why, why this is so much or whatever. Another way you can protect yourself is to have require two signatures, uh, the bookkeepers and someone you trust or you, but it don't have to be you. It depends on where you put your trust. Or you can say, on items over a certain amount of money, I want to sign them or I want the vice president to sign them so that you can give yourself protection with large ticket items. But it's good to, to, to do this because if you start out doing this, you're not saying to someone, I don't trust you, I don't think you're trustworthy. It's just, it's just the rules, it's just what you've set up. Because here's why I'm telling you that it's of value. People need to be encouraged to be trustworthy because there's always someone being tempted. 
And folks don't join your organization or take a bookkeeping job with the intent of stealing from you. No, it's more like the answer is always going to be, well, well, Latoya, I just wanted to borrow that money for a week or two, and I, I'm, I'm going to put it back in. I promise you, I'm going to put it back in. It, it may take me a week or two to do that. But the reality of it is, if someone is in that bind, and they're uh, more apt to just take the money without telling you, thinking they're going to borrow it and put it back, it don't ever happen. Matter of fact, they would say, well, I planned on putting it back on Wednesday, but on Tuesday night I had this other problem come up, and I really just had to get some more money out. Yeah. I once had the occasion to be close to a situation where someone was caught uh, stealing, bookkeeper. And when they were caught, an investigator was bought in, to look the records over before they were ever even talked to. And it looked like that they had been taking money, a small amount of money out, on a regular basis for a number of years. And it came down to it was about 50 or $60 a week. But it had been going on for 15 years. And when you multiply 15 years by 52 weeks at 60 or $70 a week, it ends up being a lot of money. So this can, this can be a big deal. That's a retirement for you. And it happens all the time, all the time. So you need to take some safeguards against it. The way you do it, it's your way. Okay, safety on being uh, robbed. When you get a check in, someone gives you a check, I want you to have your stamp ready to stamp that check and put your uh, put your uh, uh, information there uh, that tells that it's uh, to be deposit only. Not to be cashed, it says deposit only, your name, your company name, your account, uh, whatever. And when you do that to a check, if a thief comes in and steals it from you, they can't cash that check. And if they do, the bank uh, will have to make it good. So if you stamped it, they're gonna have a copy of the back of it. And they're not, a thief cannot, cash a check that says for deposit only. So you're protected and your employees are protected because if you wait till the end of the day and stuff it in your bank bag before you do anything and then it goes to, till tomorrow because you didn't have enough, you felt like to go to the bank uh, and then someone steals it from your employee on the way to the bank or they steal it. If those checks have not been canceled with that uh, a stamp, then you're in trouble. So make it a company policy. As soon as the check comes to your hand, either stamp it or write on the back of it for deposit only before you even put it into the cash drawer the first time. Okay? It's a good, good, good safeguard. Next, entrepreneurs have a kind of a policy new business do, people do say, well, it's not but $100. I'm not going to go deposit that. Or, oh, this is not but $1,700 check. I'll wait till the end of the week and wait till some more comes in and then make a deposit. So it's easier to keep up with my checkbook if I don't make so many deposits. Wrong. As entrepreneurs and new business people, we need to deposit checks daily or have one darn excuse, good excuse why you don't. Why is that? Because the sooner the check gets in the bank, the sooner it clears. That means the sooner it becomes valid, negotiable, turns into money. A check is a piece of paper, but one that's been validated and, and uh, processed through the bank becomes money. Why is that important? You, you know people aren't going to write you a bad check. Well, sometimes they do. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's not a fraud thing, but sometimes their bookkeeping goes haywire and the bank account gets short. So that every day that you give that bank account on the other end a chance to be depleted so the money's not there to cover the check the customer just gave you, you're taking a risk. So try to be in the habit of making deposits in the afternoon to get that check in the bank system before 5 o'clock so that it will clear during the night. The good thing about checks now is it used to take several weeks for checks to clear, but on average, Usually checks are cleared in a couple of days now, unless they're from 
uh, another uh, from the West Coast or Puerto Rico or somewhere like that, they'll take several days, so you have to realize that. How do you protect yourself from that? Uh, well, generally, a bank cashier's check is good safety. A wire transfer, which means you have no check involved, but the, the customer authorizes his money to be taken out of his account and sent elect electronically to your account. That's very, very safe. In general, there's not nearly as many bad checks being written now as there were 25 years ago because the North Carolina legislature said that writing a bad check now is a criminal offense and not a civil offense. Yeah, it used to be a civil offense and people wouldn't go to jail for writing bad checks, but now they do. And it's taken a lot more seriously. So uh, a lot fewer uh, ch uh, bad checks being written. When someone is paying you with a check and it's a number 001 or a 100 and it's indicating to you it is a brand new account, never been used or tested before, that should raise a red flag. And you would want to verify that the account, that the check is good, or ask that customer you know, if you are sensing their brand new code, how about you go ahead and just write in your check and give it to the bank and bring me a certified cashier's check. That takes the problem out. Why is that? Most bad checks that are written in today's world are on brand new accounts with check numbers like 100. That means someone has just got that account and just written one or two checks out of it, and maybe they didn't have enough in there to cover it. You don't want to take that risk if you don't have to. Keep that in mind. Incoming mail should be answered by you no one else. You want to see the bank statement before anybody else sees it. You want to see envelopes and open them up before anyone else does. Why? Because if there are, are letters in there talking about you hadn't paid your bill like you thought you had, a past due bills, or entry statements because accounts are getting old, or maybe some invoices on items that you didn't order or you didn't think anybody did that maybe an employee has ordered for themselves, Opening the mail goes a long way to help you with a lot of security. So keep that in mind. With QuickBooks now and other uh, fancy software systems, you can ask your operator to give you all kinds of charts and accounts on different aspects of your business. How much you're spending for one item versus the other. Where is your money going? And it actually shows you in a chart every month. You just have to have your person set it up to do that. You can get bar graphs that'll show you what items are selling now compared to last year or last month or five years ago, depending on how long you've been in your system. Give you good graphs to show you what's hot and what's not, and then you, you need to go see, figure out why. In entrepreneurship, you want your business to stay on level trends if possible, not going straight up or straight down. When you see uh, spikes and dips really sharp, that indicates there's something on the move that's being motivated. And sometimes it's really bad. It could be good, but usually it's not a good sign either way, going up or down. So you want to know why. Did the price, did your cost on this item go way up? Have people stopped buying it for some reason? Uh, have you been out of stock? Is that the problem? You'll find that and ask, you'll find those questions and what the bookkeeper information can give to you. And man, is that important. That's imperative for forecasting and determining on uh, how your merchandise is gonna work. The bookkeeper used to do all the payroll work. They used to who, who did it, but now lots of entrepreneurs are hiring someone like maybe you. Maybe you're gonna do a, have a virtual payroll business where you can do payroll for people. Uh, they had rather uh, that just be done uh, by an independent contractor who, who does it every week and does it well. The bookkeeper would just write them one check instead of writing a bunch of payroll checks. They would handle the check writing for you. But now, if you're just getting started, that's another expense that maybe you could cover with your own uh, uh, bookkeeper. But adding check writing to normal bookkeeping will uh, add to your bookkeeping fees, of course. 
right now, I want to tell you that when you're hiring your bookkeeper, and it's not a virtual one, but someone that's actually going to come and work for you full time or be in your office, you want to give them the space and the time to get the work done. Because just like I've seen you, it is a tedious job, and you need to focus on it. And if your bookkeeper is also your receptionist or the, the person that goes and gets coffee in the mail and does runs errands and parts and all these other things, I'm going to assure you that they're going to have a hard time balancing the books. And when they can't balance the books, you have to get them balanced, and therefore the accountant has to come in and see what the problem is. Even if it's a phone call and they're looking at it virtually, any minute that an accountant is working for you on the phone or in person, the meter is running. They're going to be charging you. So if the bookkeeper can get the work done without having to call the accountant, you save money. So give them the space and the time uninterrupted to get their job done right. And you can save money doing that. If it's an in-house bookkeeper, and you even have to bring in another part-time person to do the to do the uh, uh, greeting and the uh, receptionist type work or answering the phone. That's a better deal. Bring someone in part-time, morning or afternoon, uh, to to give the bookkeeper some private time to to do what she's supposed to do. Okay. Any questions about the bookkeeping cycle so far? You're welcome to ask if you'd like. No. Okay. All right. Tisha, good to have you on board. Glad to see you. Thanks for joining us. And Sarita, you as well. Forecasting. Man, we're interested in that, aren't we? Rainy, cold weather may be coming. Maybe a few more sunny days, but it's all watching that forecast. So all of us are involved in weather forecasting. Let's take a cruise, but we're not going to go on a cruise till we have a good chance to say, I'm going to be out there on the ocean. I'm going to make sure that the forecast don't have a hurricane coming my way. Or maybe you're into raising animals, and you want to make sure that you bring the mamas and the papas together so that the babies will be born in the springtime. So we're forecasting how long things will take to get to you and what will happen after they get here. That's important forecasting in husbandry work. If you're fighting wildfires, you're very interested in where lightning strikes are. Uh, my son is uh, in, fights wildfires in the southern United States for U.S. Fish and Wildlife. And part of his job every morning is to look at the, the uh, weather channels and determine where the lightning strikes were the previous day. And if there's a lot of lightning strikes in an area, in a real dry area, in a wilderness area, he knows that there's probably a little fire burning out there. It hit a tree and started a smoldering fire. And they've learned that they're smart to send people out of those areas before a fire is ever reported. It's not creating enough smoke for anybody to see. But when they look real closely, they can find those heat-sensitive heat areas and put out a little fire before they become a massive big wildfire. So forecasting is important with that type of work. What does poor forecasting mean? It means you're going to end up with a sign in front of your business that says, out of business. No forecasting means no business. It will work. It will do that for you. So that's why I think it's important that we kind of drill down into that. What are the most important areas that require you to create some forecasting skills and knowledge well? First is if you're selling products, you want to forecast how many turns you need to justify the inventory you have. Turns is an abbreviation for turnovers. You sell something, that turns it over. You get something else out, that turns it over, you sell it. You don't make profit in the business until you have a turn. <laughs> That's right. So we need to have a good idea on how many turns we're going to have on a certain product to, number one, have a good business plan, and number two, forecast how much inventory that we're going to keep. Number three, do we have the space for that inventory? So forecasting your turns on your profit center items 
you need to start doing that and doing it. And I've just showed you the first step in that is you go back to your model on that particular turn and you can start figuring it out. And it's all guesswork to begin with. I used to start out the spring season at Carver Equipment when we uh, had a, a bricks and mortar uh, dealership. I, I, to, to have the inventory I needed for January, February, and March, I usually needed about 60 lawnmowers, large diesel lawnmowers. I usually needed 125 to 160 small tractors, little tractors. I usually needed 30 to 40 larger size tractors. And that's just the rolling stock. And then there was all the implements that would go with them. And so back in, in August, we would need to figure out how many items we needed in stock to order in September that would come in in November and December so we'd have them ready to sell for the spring sale season. That's serious money and serious considerations. And then you would place an order with the manufacturer and they tell you we're not going to have that many available. And you have to go back and reconsider do you want to order something to substitute or not? That's when you need to have a good DNA factor about determining what's hot and what's not, because that's when the big mistakes are made. Sometimes you're better off not to order anything rather than to order something in that's going to use up your money or your ability to find something that does. So serious consideration for forecasting turns is absolutely needed. Staffing issues. Let's say now you have a business that you're going to be providing services, selling time for money, and you want to grow your business, and you can't do it so much in a day's time. You may already have a full slate of responsibilities, but you want to hire some people to help you grow your business. Uh, uh, cleaning this, uh, painting that, uh, uh, mowing grass here and there, uh, making products. Uh, whatever it is, staffing issues, if you wait till the last minute, you're not going to find them. As we were talking earlier, sometimes you can find and, and, and some senior citizens, uh, folks that are, you know, are maybe retired or semi-retired, that you can count on them like a clock, but they don't want to work full time. And you would like to have some young folks to come and work with you, start in your business, but they are really hard to nail down. It's like herding, herding cats, and there's just a few that you can count on to begin with. But if you want them, you've got to go look for them. You have to be willing to pay them and care about them so they care about you. So it is a forecasting challenge. But you have to accept it if you don't have that business. Now, I have the pleasure now of working with all virtual employees, people helping me part-time, where in the past I've had as many as 2,000 employees, and I know how difficult it is to keep the best ones and learned how. So you've got a, a learning curve in front of you, so think about that. Right along with that comes your cash flow position. I want to do more. I want to sell more. I want to have a big sale year, but you have to buy that stuff before you own it enough to sell it. So you think about that as you determine how, when you're going to order, how many are going to come in at a time, how much money can I make this month to be able to reinvest in what's coming in next month? Questions to answer. Forecasting. How do you do it? You go back to your business plan and you see how your cash flow is going to work out and your budgeting, and you put it on a timeline. Now, I did a brand new uh, seminar for the small business center here in Dunn, uh, focusing on budgeting and cash flow. I don't send y'all a copy of, of that study guide, and and uh, that may be something we can get one of the directors to help us put online in a webinar. But if you want uh, some more information on that, don't hesitate to ask me because it really gets down deep into what we're talking about right now. Uh, if you request it from me, call it the the business budgeting uh, class. That's that's what we'll call it. Risk, yeah, 
risk is what we're going to look forward to not have to deal with, but they're going to come, and we know it because the risk is anything that might happen to you. You need to make a list of them. The things you know of that may put your business under. And I'll give you a little tip. If you don't need some insurance, the insurance man knows every risk involved in your business because that's what insurance companies do, and they've already got printouts that I tell you. So you talk to your independent insurance agent about what the business you're in. He can go right to his computer, to his uh, insurance companies, and they got a printout for every kind of company there is. That's important now that I can tell you that's why the insurance company will go after your business as a, as a new business because they want new business just like you do. And they're going to give you a pretty, pretty decent rate. But that rate is going to be based on how well you're handling your risk management issues. That's right. And the more that you're doing to avoid risk, the lower your premium will be. The less you're doing, the higher it is. So when you go on with a new insurance company, in about six months, they're going to call you up and say, they're going to send a, an inspector around or an insurance appraiser, whatever they may call them. Specialist, maybe. And that specialist will sit down with you and go over all these risks and just ask you what you're doing about it. Now, they gave you this list when you signed up with the policy. You may not remember it because they were in a big stack of papers. But now you don't start remembering because he's going to check every item and see what you're doing to avoid the risk. And if you're doing a poor job, I'm going to tell you, your premium is going to go up. If you're doing a great job, it may stay the same. They will, if you're doing a really poor job, probably tell you that they're going to give you 90 days to make some serious improvement in your risk management or they're going to counsel your policy. No, they're not going to be hung out there with your risk if you're not trying to fix it. Because I know they know it's going to cost them. Most of the time, though, I don't want to scare you here. Most of the time in the time kind of businesses that you guys are in, thinking about starting, the risks are common sense. <clears throat> and the risk management tools are common sense. And maybe since you haven't been there before, you don't have the common sense to know what they are. But anyone else that's been around does. That's why it's pretty good to say that when you're thinking in this consideration <clears throat> that you're wise to talk with someone with some white hair. Someone has been there and done that or knows where to get the answers. And then apply that information to your situation to really save you a lot of money and stress with risk management. Now, the, the uh, directors, small business center directors in the three schools that you are involved in all are really good, and I'm really good at this. So if you're ready to go on that journey, I'll be glad to, to help you get some good information. The total goal of forecasting is not only to avoid the risk, the bad things, but to enjoy the good things. So our goal in forecasting, my goal in forecasting, is, have, is to have the right products or the right service with style and quality and size that people want. I want to be able to sell it for the highest price possible. Still offering a good value, but as high a price as I can. And I want to be able to buy it or secure it at the lowest price possible. So what is, the, what is right in the middle of those two things, right here where the cursor is dancing around? What is right in there? What have I taught y'all in week two and three and four? What, what, is, what is right in the middle of the lowest price possible and the highest retail selling price possible? Fair market value. Fair market value. We always want to buy as far below fair market value as we can, and sell as far above fair market value as we can. Remember, we're going to connect those dots so they all make sense. Now, this is going to be kind of new subject matter for you, but I want to tell you how important it is. Tonight, we're talking about forecasting and negotiating, and here's a sentence at the top of this slide that says, forecasting on one end and negotiating on the other. And in the middle of those two words is successful. 
I mentioned this earlier because I'm going to tell you right now that you can you can forecast how a negotiation will go. You can do it. But to do that, to have that knowledge and confidence and skill level requires one thing, total preparation. Total preparation. You can right now by considering what your target goals are in this negotiation, the pricing ranges that you have, what terms do you have to work with, and what concessions do you have to offer. By considering all these things, you can put together an advanced, organized preparation for any negotiation you're going. Now, in our next series, next five weeks of series, We'll dive, dive one night we'll go real deep into this and focus on only that and actually have some samples of buying cars, buying real estate, buying this and that and show you how to, how to forecast how that negotiation goes. Now I just want to tell you that you can do it. You can know what's in the future there. And it starts out basic. To have a successful negotiation, your plan needs to include how you've introduced yourself how you're coming into the game. That's why doing these uh, uh, video introductions because more and more important, we need to get good at it. That first impression of being glad to see someone, showing that energized, giving that professional image, so important in this. Mindset is huge. Negotiating with someone, oftentimes the inexperienced entrepreneur will say, well, that person is trying to beat me out of all my profit. They're trying to take all my profit away so they can end up with the best deal that they get. I mean, it's just that simple uh, and, and aggressive and, and, and uh, naive, actually, to think that way. There's enough truth in it that, that you know, you can, you can make an argument. But you will not be the successful negotiator if that's your mindset. The mindset that will lead you to better negotiations and more is saying, this person I'm working with is my negotiating partner. We're partners in this negotiation, both of us after a win-win situation. I have my goals. They have their goals. If we're going to be able to do business for the long term, we're going to need to come together and be satisfied that both of us are getting a fair deal. But if one party is all about, I'm just going to try to beat you out of every penny that you can get, that's going to make it quite difficult. Not impossible, but more difficult. So your introductions and your mindset are important. Where you sit in the room is important. Where you position yourself as you're having this negotiation is very important. Now, in some situations, like in the office here, you might have to sit across the desk from someone. Face to face, I don't like that because that means it's face to face, almost like we're against each other on the opposite sides. And even if I'm coming up to a death situation like that, I would I would more have to look, go back here to this easy chair back here and pull that chair around to the side. So I'm actually sitting at the end of the desk and kind of on the same side or near the same side as the person I'm talking to. I almost refuse to have negotiations across the table, and it's made a big difference through the years. Even if it's uncomfortable to say, hey, let's come over here and sit. Or let's stand up and walk out here and talk. Sometimes we say, let's walk out here in the fresh air and talk about this. So that you're able to position yourself beside someone and then use these words. I appreciate this opportunity to, to work with you, and hopefully we can find a win-win deal. I mean, I'm on the same side you are here. Uh, we, we, we need to make this work. Those words are important, and they sink in. So few negotiators know how to use them and never would even think about saying that. They rather just go ahead and battle it out and say, well, take it or leave it. Well, the word negotiation is not in, those, in that sentence, take it or leave it, is it? No, it's either pay me what I want, or I'm going to leave, or you can leave and go somewhere else. And when that is the message being sent, 
85 to 90 percent of the time they will go somewhere else okay the documents that you bring to the table when you're trying to sell something uh, think about if you ever had a real estate person bring uh, their, their deal to you. It's all prepared. I mean, they know all about making the documents a work of art because the goal is to have all the, the lines filled in that you possibly can before you sit down at the table to close your deal so that you can win the situation and win the moment, get a signature and deposit or a witness, and, and it's over instead of, Going through all this knit nap, scratch, hen scratch, having to go back and retype documents and redo things because they weren't done right the first time or hadn't even tried to do them. So your documents need to be as close to being 100% prepared as you can make them. And you need to have on your mind or in your hand a list of the most frequently asked questions related to what you're selling. So when the question comes up, you can answer it. You're ready. You're ready. And in business, you're going to be, every time you go into a negotiation for this particular product or service, you're going to be asked the same question. So that's not a big deal that I'm asking you to do. Yeah, you be ready to go for it. You want to know your bargaining range. If you're selling or buying, you want to know what the high dollar is that you can work with and the low dollar. And make that spread as wide as you can now, but be, be true to yourself on both ends, especially the low dollar if you're selling. And in that low dollar that you're selling for, that you would consider, you want to make sure that your profit's in there, enough profit that you can be sustainable. And from that number, everything up is higher, is higher up. So the range needs to be, you need to write it down on a piece of paper, 10000 to 4000 600 to 750, whatever it is, have a good idea in the range. When you do that, then you can roadmap your offers and counter offers. Because once you establish the high price, the, the, the um, advertised price, then I can tell you, and you will in time pretty much be able to guess what that low dollar offer is going to be. When someone comes in and makes their first offer to you, it's going to be certainly below your advertised price, but how low? It's generally going to be just below fair market value. That's, if, if, if anyone has had training in buying and selling, that's generally where they would offer. So if you know that, you know what your counter is, you can sit right down on a piece of paper and write them down in advance. If you don't think that you'll get three offers on this or two or four or ever how many, you have your plateaus, your counter offers already predicted and written down. That will take you probably about 30 minutes of consideration. But if it's a big ticket item and it's the difference in you making $1,000 versus $3,500, that's pretty good pay for a few minutes, isn't it? Yeah. But if you're just going to say, I'm going to go in here, here's my low dollar, they offer me that, I don't take it then you're not being much of a negotiator and you're cheating yourself and your company out of a lot of potential profit. Plus, if that's what you're going to be doing, you could hire anybody to do that. And you might be able to sit at home and drink coffee and not make much money, but maybe let somebody else give your stuff away. Just keep that in mind. Or have a roadmap of your range and your offers. Now, the secret weapon I'm going to share with you right now is that you want some secret weapons every time you go into a negotiation. And I'm not going to charge you one penny for this million dollars worth of advice. Your secret weapons in, in, in high stakes negotiations is the value added features that you can bring to the conversation. You have already determined what your value added features are. That's the things that you're going to offer that other people are not. And it's not gonna cost your customer anything more or very little more, but certainly a lot better value. That's maybe the amount of the deposit that you need, the delivery terms, what conditions is it assembled or not assembled? Can the customer come and pick it up and save several hundred dollars? Can 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 we 
do this on a rental deal or a rental purchase and save you some serious tax implications. You have to be smart with your business and know these value add items. Now, can you see, because these are going to be the deals that close your deals, that bring it together where you find common ground. Because most of the time, it's not the dollar that makes the most difference. It's not the cheapest that gets the deal. So you can see now why professional negotiators who know their products and, and own the preparation will get 90% of the deals because they got such better, powerful weapons and tools in their tool belt. How do I know that? Because we do that, and we've done it in a long time. And that's why we're still here after 64 years. Are we perfect? No. no. We learn every day. But there's some basic fundamental selling skills that will get you deals when the other people that had a cheaper price or standing over there wagging their head can't figure out how in the heck did old Steve-O get that deal and, and the customer didn't deal with me. It's a whole lot of th these different things that we're talking about. Okay? And I'll say right now, I'll lose some business because some people want that cheapest price and that is the end of the story. And I try to find ways to negotiate with them and get their business too. But sometimes someone is there after that cheapest, cheapest, cheapest price, and you're not willing to sell below a certain margin, then, then you can't get all the business. But you can get all the good business. So next, we've got right down to where the customer has decided they're ready to buy, or you sense that they are moving from a interested listening uh, situation to they're kind of moving to I'm ready to buy. And when you sense that, your most powerful secret weapon, because they have hung in there with you and negotiated back and forth, and y'all have gotten really close, your ability to capture a moment, to make time stop, to mesmerize your customer, and capturing the moment so that everything is being listening to you and you've got the power then to move mountains because you have their full attention and they like where you're going. They've, they've decided and given indicators that, yeah, I think I can do this deal. You will learn right then to bring drama and be dramatic, to bring some suspense and steal, the, steal, the, the, uh, steal a few seconds of time, out of time, and bring it all into what you're saying and where you're trying to go with this. And you can do that with a, uh, an eye movement, lowering your voice, taking a long silence, turn the volume down to the point that we're having to listen really close for you to make your closing remarks, to bring them, to bring them home, to bring them home. When you learn to do that, it is fun. <laughs> Not only will you enjoy it, but your trading partner will enjoy it as well. It takes a little practice to recognize situations. You've got to get in the situation first. You've got to bring them to that deal, that negotiating point. And the higher the ticket items that you sell, the more opportunities you'll have. Next week, I'm going to dive deeper into that and actually give you the nitty-gritty on some of it. Every professional negotiator knows that I'm not going to buy something until I have an alternative. In other words, I don't do my homework and know where I can go buy the item I'm shopping for for a certain price, and it's a, re a reasonable price and a pretty good deal, I think. In other words, I can go buy this tank for $15,000, and I think it's a good deal. I've checked it out. But I'm not going to go buy it today because now it's time for me to start negotiating and see if I can save some money or to convince myself that this is the best deal I can get. Now I'm going to go out in the market and I'm going to make offers on similar tanks of same value. Not for $15,000. My offers are going to be for $12,000. I'm going to try to buy that item for $12,000. 
and I'll go here and I'll go there and I'll make low offers lower than my alternative. Do you think I'm being silly? Do you think people will be mad at me and look at it like crazy? Nah. Because professional negotiators, they want an offer because nothing starts until an offer starts. And you don't know, especially when buying products, what the real deal is on the other side. The selling person may have got an extra low price on this when they bought it, and they got more margin than, than anyone else does. Maybe the seller is in a cash flow crunch, needs some cash right now, and will sell that product at cost just to get his money out of them. And you won't ever find that out unless you're out here negotiating, making low offers, and then seeing how far you can, uh, what, what, what you can walk away is. So negotiating starts after you have an alternative. You gotta be disciplined to do this because lots of times when you find that deal you've been looking for and you think it's good, and we say to ourselves, hey, I gotta buy this, it'll be gone if I don't get it today. <laughs> Well, someone has put a good, a good negotiating thought in your head, but you need to keep shopping, okay? Next, don't fear making an offer that someone will, will not like you or think you're crazy because people in the negotiating business setting prices on things, they will appreciate it. They will think more of you because you're trying to get the best deal you can for yourself, for your business, for your family. That's right. That's, that's the way, the mindset you want to be if you don't have a long-term good experience in negotiations. But I did want to mention to you, if you do find someone that you can buy that item from for a much lower price than 15000 before you seal that deal, you need to go back to them and give them the courtesy. Thank you so much for giving me a great offer to begin with. And I, I had to keep shopping just to convince myself that was the best offer. And I need to say to you that if you can do any better, I've got a, I've got a, an offer that's considerably less. So would you like to reconsider? And if you do, I'll give it consideration. That's fair, that's good business that will create a relationship with you with that uh, seller that you can go back to them in the future because that's all you can do. So but if you're on the other side of that, if you're the fellow that made the good offer and they're coming back offering you less, and I've been there lots of times and that is disappointing. Now it's disappointing, I appreciate it, but at least they didn't just go ahead and buy from someone else, at least they came back. Then I will look them in the eye and say, Oh man, I just thought I'd have that deal in hand, and I'm, I'm sorry to see now that it's in jeopardy. So you asked me to give you your best deal. Let, let me. I am. I am. I'm on the money right now. But here's here's what I need to say to you. Make me an offer that you can pay me right now. Make me an offer that we can do a deal right now. Ah, so you put the ball back in their court. And when they come back with that offer, you know what just happened? <laughs> it all started again. And it's time for you to start being a salesperson and negotiator and saying yes, if, or no, but. Yes, if, no, but negotiating means that you're going to keep the conversation alive as long as you can to find a win-win proposition and close your deal. When that customer came back to you and made an offer, they said something more than just, I, I need to talk some more because i got a much better offer. They're saying to you in nonverbal communication, I like you, <laughs> and I, I would like and rather to do business with you than the other people. They, they didn't say that, but that's, that's the message. So it's up to you now. Not just to say, no, I can't come another inch, take it or leave it, get on, go go pay them, don't ever come back. That's virtually what a lot of people do. Instead of that, what's the best offer you can make me and pay me right now? That opens the door for yes, if, no, but, for you either to take it or to keep talking about it to see if you can get them up a little bit. <clears throat> because lots of times they'll pay you a little more. How do you know they'll pay you a little more than what they did? 
because the offer that they will make for you lots of time is exactly what the other person offered to sell it to them for. But they came back to you and maybe we'll pay you a little more because they see value added there. That's why they're here. Work with that. Basic rules. There's a lot of different uh, uh, rules of engagement in, in fundamental negotiating. There's four basic rules I want to drive home hard to each of you. Rule number one, never give up anything unless you're getting something in return. That's, you need to kind of hang on to that. And I will show you some negotiating ploys a little later where people try to take that away from you. But if you as a professional are not going to give up anything unless you get something in return, you're on solid ground. <clears throat> Try to make them make the first offer. If you're selling, set your price up high enough, I mean way high, to know <clears throat> that any offer they make is going to be below that, and you're going to have some negotiating room. So try to get them to make you the first offer. Okay? Now, if you're the one on the other side that's going to buy, and you knowing that they're trying to make you to make the, the, the best offer, you want to make sure that your first offer is way, way down below what? Fair market value. Because their real high price has got to be way above fair market value. So for you to find common ground, your first offer needs to be way, way below fair market value where you know it's a steal, not just a deal. Number three, and the best advice I can give you, when you're going into any buying situation, your first words out of your mouth after you've had the relationship building chit-chat is, is that your best price? It is so high compared to other things I've seen. It's just so high. Uh, come on, man. Let's get in the real world. Tell me what. Tell me what the, the, the lowest price is on this thing. Well, I've been doing business a long time with people in this area, and especially Sampson County farmers. And Sampson County farmers are the best negotiators in the whole worldwide world. I am convinced. And they use this tactic in a lot of different ways, but it all adds up to what we call poor mouthing. Coming forward with sentence out of your mouth that says, I'm so poor, I need the best price I can get. And they may be millionaires, but it's going to be that same logic and tactic, and they're going to say, oh, come on, Steve, get serious. Give me your best price. This is so high, it's ridiculous. What is your best price? They open up a negotiation like that. And what does that do? That gets them something for nothing. A few words get that hopefully will get them a better concession. If you're on the other side of that, like negotiations are, and I have a customer come to me and lay that on me so much, I will say that is the best poor mouth and tactic I've ever had a Sanson County farmer lay on me. I just put it out there just like that. I recognize it for what it is. And now here's the deal. I want to do business with you today, and I appreciate that offer. But now make me an offer that you can write a check for. Yeah. Put the ball in there, court, and you're getting something real to get the negotiating started. Okay? Number three. Leaned on it a little earlier, but now we're going to talk about it specifically. You don't stop the process. They, they can stop it any time they want to, but if you want the deal and you got the energy and you must have the energy to keep on talking, to keep saying yes, if, and no, but, to keep the conversation alive, keep it talking, keep hope, close your deal, know indeed that maybe you got a chance here. But you've got to keep it alive with yes, if, and no, but. Keep it coming alive because, again, the best deals are closed, not based on the pro on the bottom line, but on the value added issues. Negotiating tactics employees, there's 21 of them, and you've got a handout on them, and they're very, very important. We're going to talk about nine of them very quickly, uh, and and they're important. But we, we'll spend more time on this in a few weeks in another lesson. But very important, the, the nine most used tactics now are burst to bubble, 
That's when someone asks you, would you consider a really low ball offer? What that is, is they're setting you up for a low ball offer. And just the setup is important because it improves their position, maybe. And you always say, if you're on the other side, absolutely. Yeah, I'll consider your offer. So say we do business because nothing starts. Flinching. Fred Sanford, the old uh, fellow that bought and sold stuff on TV, he would say when you made him an offer, oh, his big heart attack, that just kills me. I can't stand it. Flinching is showing a negative reaction to someone making you an offer, and lots of times they will come right back and, and say, well, let me take a little money off that. Uh, maybe $100 off of this wouldn't hurt you so bad. Silence. Someone makes you an offer, you just look at them. Be still. Don't say anything. You just be still. Look around the room like, like Otis, my bulldog, just not interested. And you don't say anything until they do. And they're going to say, well, well, what do you think? Is something wrong? You just shake your head, stay silent again. And then possibly if they're inexperienced, they're going to say, well, let me take a little money off that. Maybe that would feel a little better. Something for nothing. If you're on the other side of that, you would say, wow, did that make you go speechless? Well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Let me raise my price back up a little bit to where you might be more interested in because I've, I've, I've come way too low. And that will get a verbal reaction and then conversation to start. Pending price increase, big deal during inflation times. You're always safe to say, you need to do the deal today because price increase is probably a lot higher tomorrow. That's a good incentive to close your deal. Other side of that, well, I'm not quite ready to buy, but would you consider taking a small deposit and holding that for me at this price for a few days? Then you can find out whether or not they've already bought it or not and price increase, if that's the case, price isn't going to increase on what they've already bought and paid for. So that's the way you would handle that. Red herring is when the car salesman will talk about all the good things so you don't notice the bad thing. Lean up against a car and cover up a dent. Talk about everything else on the car, but don't tell about that dent. If you're on the other side of this, you make sure you look items over real close because everybody will use a red here. Split in the difference. I want 300. You want 100. We split the difference and do the deal at 200. It's a good closing process. It's a good, good ploy. When someone offers to split the difference from you, that is a buying signal and you've probably got the deal, and I want you smarter than this. I can teach you how to make money even though you thought it will split the difference. Show me the cash is powerful. You say to that person, look here, I can buy it for this amount of money right here in my hand. Now, do you want to take it, or do you want me to walk out the door with it and give it to someone else? There's no splitting on that, and that will bring people to their knees and to your price oftentimes. Nibbling is when you keep asking for stuff without expecting to pay for it. Ask for it as long as people are going to give it to you. On the other side of the fence, when you close a deal, you get a signature and a circle, and they come nibbling, then you say, yes, if, and no, but I'll give you this. I'll add this to the deal, but we're going to need to add some money to it as well. <coughs> The 12 other items are in your handout, and you need to be reading them and checking them out real close. People will talk themselves out of a deal. Sometimes salesmen just talk way too much and way too long, and they like to hear their voice so much. They just keep on and on and on. It is important for us to recognize buying signals and move to close the deal then so we can hush. When people are assuming ownership in the things they say or talking about delivery or concentration on buying details or looking forward to the time it can be delivered, that's a buying signal and you need to stop selling and start closing. Start closing. So important. And then you wrap it up quickly. You get your paperwork done, collect your signatures, down payment. And number one thing, congratulate them. And this is maybe the most important line I need to close out with tonight. You congratulate them on being a great negotiator and taking advantage of you and, and getting the best deal you've ever given anybody and just hope 
that you can do some more business with them in the future, so maybe you make a little money on the next deal. That's what people want to hear. That's what people want to hear. And they will indeed, they will indeed uh, come back to see you and be happy to work with you in the future and tell other people about what a fun job it was to do this deal with you, and that is a raving fan customer. So learn to be quiet, get out of the way, and leave as soon as you can. Our goal is to become a great negotiator with our customers, with our vendors, with our lenders. You having a reputation as a new business person, someone that knows how to negotiate for a win-win situation with negotiating partners will carry you forward for many, many years. So someday you don't need some consideration and you need to negotiate with people who trust you that you've done business with. So I'm encouraging you to find people you like to do business with and stay with them. Give them a second chance if they're just way out of line price-wise. Try to find people that you can stay with and that way you become a giver instead of a taker. In other words, you give people opportunities that deserve them and take advantage of the situation when, you, when you're able to get good deals, pass it on. All right, that's my story and we'll stick to it. Thank you so much for staying with us tonight. Apply these to your work. Next week, we're going to talk about basic taxes and record keeping and how to close deals. We're going to close this circle up. And I hope I'll see all of you then. But now, if you got any con, uh, comments about negotiating, bookkeeping, or forecasting, let's have it. Thank you. Thank you, Tisha. I appreciate you coming with us. Are things doing well in Magnolia? And Sarita, Janae, Latoya, y'all have any comments? No, I just said thank you. <laughs> oh, that was you. All right, okay, Janae, thank you so much. Look forward to seeing you soon. Hey, Steve. Great class. How are you doing today? Hey, Sarita, we're doing well. I hope you are. Are you ready for a good weekend? Yeah, might as well be. <laughs> <laughs> you going to stay in town or take a trip? I'll probably stay in town. Yeah. All right. Well, it's good to hear from you. I hope you can stay dry. I think it's going to be wet. Yeah, I think so, too. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Have, you seen our, uh, have you seen our friend Rayford lately? I saw him yesterday. I saw him yesterday. Um, well, give him a hug for me. He's a great fellow. I'd like to see him back in class. Yeah, I think he's still at the barn now. Uh-huh. All right, everyone, let me say to you, God bless you. Uh, I've got you in my prayers and your business as well. I hope you have a great weekend. Look forward to seeing you next week. And uh, we'll wrap up this series, and I'll uh, be happy to do that. And we'll jump right into another one week after next. Take care. Take care.